Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, the podcast where we dig into the back catalog to select a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. What's up, guys? The video version of today's episode is available on YouTube. If you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your pl- uh, podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. This week, we've chosen the 2015 film Krampus. While the holiday season represents the most magical time of year, ancient European folklore warns of Krampus, a horned beast who punishes naughty children at Christmas time. When dysfunctional family squabbling causes young Max to lose his festive spirit and unleashes the wrath of the fearsome demon. As Krampus lays siege to the Ingle home, mom, pop, sister, and brother must band together to save one another from a monstrous fate. Krampus was released on December 4th, 2015, on a budget of $15 million and made $61 million. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 66% and an audience score of 52%. So, Todd, let's talk Krampus. Spoilers are ahead. All righty. So let me start off here before I throw it to you, Todd. So anybody that's not aware of Krampus or the lore or the legend of Krampus here, okay. just a little information here. So the Krampus is a horned anthropomorphic. Oh. I think I got that right. Figure in the central and eastern Alpine folklore of Europe who, during the Advent season, scares children who have misbehaved. Assisting St. Nicholas or Santa Claus, the pair visit children on the night of December 5th, with St. Nicholas rewarding the well-behaved children with gifts such as oranges, dried fruit, walnuts, and chocolate, while the badly behaved ones receive punishment from Krampus with birch rods. Oh. That's... uh. Uh, Santa coming to my house and giving me an orange. I think <laughs> I think I might rather have the birch rod. Todd. Right, right. Uh, so Todd, uh, start talking about Krampus here. Where you want to start? Actually, uh, believe it or not, where I wanted to start at is with that uh, opening montage over the credits with that holiday chaos. Mm. The, our Black Friday trampling scene. Yeah, the Black Friday trampling, just the uh, sheer mass of uh, just shoppers going completely loco. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, anybody like myself that's ever worked retail this time of year, uh, as of this recording, this is the Monday before Christmas. We've got one week till Christmas. Mm-hmm. If you work retail, you know what kind of personal hell this week is going to be. So, uh, I mean, that scenes are a little bit exaggerated at the first of the movie, but it's not that far from hitting close to home. So, uh, Oh, yeah. We used to see those videos. Also. Not so much this year. We didn't see as many of those. It was a lot of like, where is everybody on this side, right. uh, on these big shopping days of the season? But in years past, it definitely was pretty true to life when it was uh, people pushing each other and stealing things from each other and trampling each other. Don't miss those times, for no. sure. It's actually a lot more. Uh, people finally come to their senses and do it more of it online than in store, I think. But yeah. uh, Everything's so high now, too. Everybody's yeah. like, we have TVs. We have nice things. Uh, give us groceries. You know, that's right, what everybody right. wants now. It's like we all have nice 4K TVs because we've bought them for the last, you know, 4K TVs cost half of what they used to. But, like, give us uh, – we need groceries. We need food. Exactly. But I basically wanted to start here just to have a little PSA for be kind to your retail workers this week. They're doing the best that they can. <laughs> fair enough, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So uh, our story kind of centers around the Engel family. We have, uh, let's see, I'll let you go through them, Todd, and I'll, I'll highlight some of the cast here. Who's our who's our main family? Okay, uh, we have the son, Max. Uh, Max, played by MJ Anthony. Uh, Father Adam. Father Tom, played by Adam Scott. Oh, I'm sorry I wrote that down wrong. My bad. <laughs> Father Tom, yeah, Tom Scratch Engel, it. played by Adam Scott. Todd yeah. does good notes, folks. <laughs> yeah, Parks and Rec's own uh, Adam Scott. <laughs> uh, Mother Sarah. Yep, played by Tony Collette. Uh, Sister Beth. Uh, Beth, that's, uh, I might butcher this, Stefania uh, Owen. And uh, their, uh, Tom's mom, uh, the grandma, her name is Omi, O-M-I. Yeah, Krista Stadler. Okay. And then uh, basically uh, they're kind of gathered. It's, uh, I think it's just a couple of days before Christmas, I think, is when the film opens. I think so. Uh, and basically uh, they're kind of just your ordinary, average kind of, you know, upper middle class kind of family, I would say. Right. You know, middle class to upper middle class, probably more upper middle class, they I would say. They look more upper, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we kind of see them coming back home. Uh, they're kind of preparing for Christmas. Uh, Omi's like in hol- you know, in the kitchen, you know, making cookies and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, they're they're kind of, uh, kind of bemoaning and... Uh, the arrival of, I guess it's the mom's 
Her her sister, yeah. Yeah, her sister who is who is played by let's see, that's Linda played by Allison Tolman, and then we have her husband Howard played by David Keckner. People may know from Anchorman, been a bunch of different comedy things over the years. Right. And then I think they have three children. I think it was uh Howie Junior. Yeah. Uh Jordan, Stevie, and it was a baby. I think it was baby Chrissy. Oh yeah, I forgot the baby yeah. as well. So uh take and also us- they bring along Aunt Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I, I forgot about Aunt Dorothy, uh, played by Conchata Farrell. So people may know her from uh, Two and a Half Men fame. Oh, yeah. She played Berta, the housekeeper. She's uh, hilarious on that show. Yeah, exactly. So uh, kind of take us through a little bit of the opening of the film here, Todd. Uh, what, what's going on What's the, what's the once the in-laws arrive? And uh, kind of give us our setup here. So we kind of get this feeling from Max that he's kind of at that age where he's not certain if he still believes or not believes. He's kind of still leaning toward believes. Uh you can tell he's kind of, he's not happy with things that's going with his, his his family life. He's a little, he was closer to his sister, but now she's kind of a teenager. She's kind of aged out of him. His mom and dad aren't quite as close as they used to be. Right. Uh, the in-laws come in, uh, they're a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the two, they're, Howie Jr. is the boy. They have uh, two daughters and then the baby, but the two daughters are really, they really uh, kind of bully and chastise Max. They call him Maxi Pad. Yeah, they see the Santa note sticking out of his back pocket and they make it an effort to try to get it away from him, which they do. Right, exactly. They read it at the dinner table for everybody, and it's uh, you know it's a, a sweet note written by a kid who, like you said, he's still on that the precipice. He's getting to that age where he's questioning whether what things are real, if Santa's real or not. Right, and they kind of embarrass him by reading his note to Santa, which kind of outlines what you were talking about. He wants kind of his parents to get back together. Uh, he also wants his uncle Howard to stop treating uh, his daughters like they're boys. Right, which is set up during the film as well. But yeah, it kind of leads to uh, kind of what happens next as you go through here Todd so they uh, he kind of has a little bit of a blow up and he goes up to his room and uh, he's just kind of distraught and uh, he just takes that letter and he's just had enough he just rips it up throws it out the window right exactly we see it float up into the ether and uh, from then that kind of sets uh, the things in motion that, that we'll kind of see from here uh, from here on out uh, you know Adam Scott uh, Tom Max's father he kind of comes in tries to comfort him tell him that the holidays are chaotic that he should love his family and you know kind of gives him back the letter at first but then that's uh, when he takes it and eventually decides he's had enough he's had enough of the holidays he's had enough of uh, believing in Santa believing in something believing in uh, that his family will ever change so to speak too uh, so later that night a kind of a, out of nowhere a severe blizzard kind of engulfs the town it causes a power outage um, nothing happening on the streets. There's nobody out except for DHL, apparently. Right. DHL, DHL still delivering. DHL is very committed, Todd. Uh, <laughs> he delivers, a delivery guy uh, delivers a couple packages to the house, uh, sort of very mysterious-looking, weird-type packaging. Right. Uh, l- little Eastern European vibe to them, I would say. Yeah. But, yeah, the delivery guy, he's very committed. He ultimately plays the price uh, <laughs> as he's pretty much frozen solid later on in the film. Um it's also set up that Beth, uh, she's the sister, she's Max's sister. Um, she's kind of, you know, obviously in that uh, kind of 15, 16, 17 yeah. range. She's also kind of over it. You know, she sees her family as kind of like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like, I don't even know how to describe it. What's the word I'm looking for here, Todd? She's just basically just uh, just she, over him. She's yeah, she's kinda, just... She's just She's kind of over Christmas, over interacting with her yeah, family. She sees her family kind of like goofy and kind yeah. of corny and like trying to kind of put on airs maybe a little bit right. and pretending to be people that they're not a little bit. And so it's kind of set up. She's kind of in her room, uh, kind of talking to her boyfriend who lives a couple of blocks away. It's kind of sad. So uh, once this all happens, uh, she kind of is the first one to kind of venture out into the blizzard, you know. Phones are down. There's nothing on TV. Uh, but she goes out because she wants to check on her boyfriend. I think she lived. He says she says he lives about four blocks away, and that's the, the kind of first person to venture out. And what what does she find out there, Todd? Still a little bit surprised. Her her mom and dad let her go out into that. You know? I was too. I was like, there's no. I mean, even though it's four blocks, like <laughs> bone I'm, chilling cold, blizzard conditions, no, no one, power, no one else out. 
out. No, no one's stirring or nothing. Exactly. There's no yeah. way for you to get in touch with me. Go ahead. Your cell phone is not working. You know, there's no TV. There's no internet. Like, I can't call you. Like, but yeah, sure. Go on walking out into the, the freezing cold. I think at first she comes upon an abandoned snowplow right there near his house. Which then, gets, which is uh, set up for right. uh, later use, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I think on top of that house she sees Krampus and he starts jumping from rooftop to rooftop. Exactly. She sees like a shadowy figure. You can tell he's kind of wearing like a cloak or overcoat. Uh, obviously something that looks not of this world uh, that we'll, we'll kind of see a little bit more Krampus later. Uh, she kind of uh, gets a little kind of cat and mouse with Krampus a little bit, but then she all, uh, eventually ends up underneath that snowplow. Right. And what's left there is a little jack-in-the-box. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, beside her under the under the snowplow, uh, Krampus never shows up. Krampus doesn't do anything to her, but he leaves her a little gift there of a, a jack-in-the-box, and it's kind of left to your imagination what comes out of that box, what kind of happens to her. Yeah. You really, really don't know at that point uh, – what uh, what is there? I uh, something that surprised me. You know, this kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, I figured that we'd see more of her at some point. Yeah, you never really see Beth again. Do no, you? she doesn't come back. I figured it would be something like she would come back towards the end of the film, and you know, maybe help with help Max or help something or do something, or she'd been surviving out there on her own somehow, but you don't see her pop back up again. That's like, true. That's yeah. her, her really, her final scene. And she, I guess, apparently got, got under the snowplow by whatever was in the Jack, Jack in the, in the box. box. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so where do we go from here, Todd? Take it up here. Uh, so back at the house, uh, Tom and uh, in-law Howard, they're kind of debating on, you know, they got to go out and look for her. Where's Beth at? You know, it's it's not getting any, you know, the storm ain't letting up. And, you know, it's bitterly cold. So uh, they go out to uh, Howard's uh, SUV vehicle. His Hummer. His Hummer, yeah. Yeah, he got a big-ass Hummer. He's got that thing loaded up in the back with weapons. And yeah, then, he's got a shotgun and a revolver. And they go strap up and go looking for Beth at her boyfriend's house. Now I really like the the set of the boyfriend's house. Like uh, it was it was creepy. It was well done. I like that uh, the detail of like how the chimneys kind of split open. Right. Or like we something came down that chimney exactly, and cracked it. Exactly. So something something real gnarly kind of came. Uh, came from there and also we get our first glimpse well actually not our first glimpse but we get our first scene with uh some type of a uh, monster under the snow oh yeah yeah that yeah. That, uh, that grabs howard's leg gnaws it up a little bit right. uh the setup between howard and tom is that howard kind of thinks tom's kind of like a pussy right like a pushover <laughs> type yeah doesn't think he's a man of action doesn't think he's a man's man so to speak so howard gains a little bit more respect for him when uh, Tom kind of takes the gun, saves him from that unseen uh, snow you Yeah, know, snow blasted monster. away a few times. Exactly. So they go back to the house. Um, they, they go back to the house. They board up the windows. Howard stands guard. I think everybody was a little too um, too ready to just accept not talking about everything. Yeah, everybody was a little bit, uh, you know, uh, Beth's out there somewhere still. They don't know where she's at. And what's also going on with what's her. happening with you guys. You come yeah. back injured. You're holding weapons. Your legs, your legs all chewed up. You exactly. Know? Like I think everybody was a little too quick to be like, oh, you know, they're like, oh, let's not talk about it right yeah, now. We'll just, we'll just hold off. Let's on brush this. this under the. I'm right. like, no, what the fuck happened? <laughs> what happened to your leg? What happened to his leg? What is out there? Why are y'all packing? <laughs> exactly. Uh, also, it's set up that uh, when they go back to Howard's, uh, uh, to Howard's Hummer, it's completely destroyed. Yeah, it's demolished. Looks like Krampus just, I don't know, got on top of it, just stomped did, it. Did a Mario on top of a <laughs> mushroom, apparently, just stomped the shit out of it. Um, that night, Howard agrees to take the the guard duty that night first. Uh, everyone eventually falls asleep. During this, we kind of see Omi, and we kind of get the hint that uh, Omi knows a little bit more than she's letting on. Yeah, she's pretty insistent that that fire must stay lit in that fireplace. Obviously, he can't come down that chimney if that fire is going. Exactly. So she she ends up falling asleep as well as everybody else, including Howard. And that's where you see in the chimney a kind of a hook kind of come down the chimney right. with a, uh, is it a gingerbread cookie? Gingerbread cookie. A yeah. gingerbread cookie. And uh, 
who gets up to uh, to go investigate none other than Howie Jr., <laughs> who is our uh, Augustus Gloop of this film. <laughs> He's our, our kind of uh, chubby uh, kid who enjoys food. So, of course, uh, a gingerbread coming down on a hook uh, just baited him perfectly. And so he goes, grabs a gingerbread cookie, of course, starts to get yoinked up the chimney. Everybody awakens to try to save him. What? Well, uh, uh, the mom, I forget her name, uh, uh, Sarah. Sarah, Tony Collette. She tries to. She's the one that grabs him first and kind of gets pulled up the chimney with him. And she kind of is the one to see what's going on a little bit up the chimney. And she sees especially that gingerbread cookie. So, uh, w- what did you think when you first? Because to this point, it's all been. Except for our one glimpse of Krampus, we haven't really seen anything. The Jack in the Box was kind of off screen. Camp uh, Krampus was kind of uh, cloaked in darkness. And then the first thing we kind of see in the film, the first creature I would say, is our uh, our, our actual alive gingerbread cookie. That to me, I mean, just in my opinion, looked a little goofy. Looked a little too goofy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's that's one little problem with this film is is those. We'll talk about some of the creatures a little bit later, but um. The, the gingerbread, that gingerbread man, and then there's there's gingerbread men at one point. Right. That's the where it gets a little bit too goofy for my taste. They're a little too plastic, rubbery, CG looking. Right. And it's just like you said, it's a little too goofy, a little too campy uh, for, I think, the tone of what this film was going for. I was kind of worried at that scene, I'm like, ooh, is this where we're going? Yeah. With animated gingerbread man. But if you if you stick with it, there there's still some uh some things to kind of pull from. Uh where do you want to go next, Ty? So I think after that, uh I think is when they kind of go upstairs and they run into some more of those creatures. There's a gnarly looking teddy bear. Uh is there you- an angel looking one too? It's kind of messed up. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, before I think before they do that, that's when we finally get uh, Omi explaining. Oh, that's right, the backstory. We get bad. her. Uh, we get Omi. She kind of now that uh, the family's kind of seen that something's after them. Uh, the, they let the fire go out. She restarts the fire. That's where we we start to. Uh, she explains that the the creature that's hunting them is Krampus, and uh, she kind of we get her her backstory in kind of an animated format. She was kind of in the same kind of vain as Max before she got kind of, uh, uh, in her mind, she kind of got disillusioned with Christmas a little bit with the the poverty and things that her family was going for. And she kind of, I guess in a way, wished away her family, I guess in a way. I think so. Or like, you know, didn't appreciate her family. And part of her, her uh, Krampus kind of coming for her was to kind of take her family away and kind of leave her as like her her punishment. Right. Uh, but overall, the animated kind of backstory, I kind of like the look of it. Yeah, that looked pretty neat, I thought. Yeah, actually, I, it, was a, it was a really good scene. It was a good way to kind Convey it, like I said. And he it, left her that little ornament, that little like, yeah, Krampus little ornament. like Krampus bobble, little Krampus ornament. Yeah, that we'll kind of see that um, will come into play again later. But yeah, basically he he and his helpers kind of dragged everybody in her family away to to hell and just left her behind with that little bobble with his his kind of name on it. You know, she she lost her parents and everybody kind of lost their spirits uh, after the hardship of the war and stuff in Europe, and then. Um, she kind of wished for her parents to kind of be taken away, and that's what ends up summoning Krampus. And she's the she's the one that kind of gives us our backstory and our a little bit of exposition there. But then we go to, as you said, the creatures. So let's let's talk about them a little bit. So uh, there are creatures that break uh, into the house upstairs. So the creatures that attack the family, we've got um, obviously we got Krampus himself. But upstairs uh, we've got Der Clown. <laughs> which is the clown worm. So that was the the coolest shot to me in the whole film is when they look over because the two daughters of Howard and Linda, they go up and they think they hear Beth upstairs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so, so they're kind of lured up, up to the attic or upstairs or whatever it is. I think it's the attic. And they think they hear Beth, but it's really the uh, the clown worm. And then when the parents make it uh, make it upstairs, the only thing you see of one of those kids is just like its leg and the foot kind of going down the down big, his throat. Yeah, the big clown worm's mouth. That was the creepiest and coolest shot of the movie to me. But we got the clown worm. We've got uh, Perkta, which is the angel that you were talking about. This little kind of demonic looking angel doll. Yeah. We've got Teddy Claw. Oh, Teddy Claw. Teddy Claw, which is the uh, the teddy bear. We've got TikTok. Not the social media app, but the little robot with the little scissor hand thing. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, also, we talked about the snow beast before. 
Uh, so what do you uh, what do you think about the, those creatures, and what do you think about those scenes in general? I think they were better looking than the gingerbread men. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I don't think they were quite as goofy looking to me anyway. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think all of those, they kind of work. It's kind of like a mix of, I think it mostly looked practical with them. Uh, it might be a mix of practical and, and, and uh, you know, effects. But, I mean, overall, those look pretty solid. Downstairs, Howard is, the, he's the one having the CGI battle. Because yeah. he's the <laughs> one getting, uh, there's uh, three gingerbread uh, men now downstairs that have found a nail gun and start to uh, use that against Howard and the the gingerbread men are lumpy clumpy and dumpy (laughs) and two of them are voiced by one is voiced by Seth Green and one is voiced by Justin Roiland of uh Sex Pest Rick and Morty fame. Oh. Yeah. In hindsight there. But yeah, all of those I thought were really good. And, I mean, the scenes upstairs were really good uh, with all of those kind of creatures. Like, I thought all that kind of stuff was solid, and it kind of brought me back into it from uh, just those, you know, kind of CG gingerbread gotcha. men we gotcha. had seen yeah. before. All right, Todd, where do you want to go next? So I think basically after those battles, they kind of get this plan together where they're going to go for the snow plow Mm -hmm. and just going to load up in it and just drive till they can basically try to find somebody, anybody. Exactly. Drive out of the storm, drive to the police station, you know, find something. You know, the dad has a map of the city. Try to get to that snow plow, see if you can get to it, get out of town. Um, And that's where uh, they take off kind of as a family. The house is kind of attacked by elves. Which is another right. creatures that we see there. You don't really. They're, they're kind of all masked in this film. They're kind of like short. They're masked. Um, a little bit creepy, but also you know kind of well done as well. Uh, but then we get Omi kind of staying behind to kind of distract and have her kind of face off with Krampus. Krampus yeah. And that's the first time that we see Krampus uh, full on. So what did you think of the look of Krampus? I actually thought that was pretty awesome. I thought it was well done. Yeah, I do too. Uh, the, I think overall it's it's kind of a blend of if if like if it's like Santa Claus had sex with a goat <laughs> and it had a baby, right? That's kind of the look of Krampus in this film. Yes. It has a very like distended face and yeah. obviously the tongue kind of coming out, very yeah. like venom like. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a little bit. I would have liked if there was a little bit more movement and expression to the face. Yeah, it seems like it's just it's kind of, it's like a. You know, obviously a very well done kind of mask or but puppet. But it was just a mask. It didn't have a lot of movement. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, the tongue kind of comes out, but it's kind of the the, the face has one kind of expression. It's kind right. of like this. It's kind of frozen, yeah. <laughs> kind of thing, you know what I mean? Krampus, is that you? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, it, I would like if there's a little bit more movement to it. But overall, I can't I can't really knock it. Um, I mean, what did you think about, you know, the effects in general? Like, let's take the whole picture from gingerbread men to 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 the you know the actual other creatures to Krampus like what what did you think of the effects in general I mean the only one that really I thought was kind of dodgy was those gingerbread guys I mean I I would agree with you I would prefer a little bit more expression from the Krampus you mm-hmm. know animatronic right maybe some eye movement or you know something else other than that tongue but right. overall I think it was pretty good uh, something that when I watch these films now, like just films in general that have snow, I'm always I'm always on the lookout for snow and what what kind of snow you're using in the film. Yeah. I think I have a note about it later, but you know, obviously in Hollywood, you know, most of these things are filmed on like a sound stage or on a set or in locations that are not not real snow and it's very costly to actually pump real snow into a set or whatever. I oh, think yeah. I read something about this and I think it's in my notes later that most of the snow that you see is made from like some type of material take that's found in like diapers oh really yeah i think is what they say okay i thought overall like the look and the aesthetic i think looked good i think everything there was no because there's some snow in movies that like take me out because i'm like that's fake (laughs) right like or that's a those are bubbles you know sometimes i'll use bubbles for snow and all kinds of different stuff so i'm like it nothing about that kind of pulled me out because i'm always on like snow watch i'm very cynical about snow in these kind of films so like that that all looked good the effects in general i think other than the gingerbread man Stuff I think yeah. if you kind of left those out or made like a real type of like puppet or maquette or something, I think you'd have been better served. But overall, there was nothing very cringe. Nothing was yeah. like eh. Right. I right. mean, I got a little bit of that from the 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 uh, chimney gingerbread man, but nothing yeah. nothing crazy. And one thing to me that not necessarily was CGI or effects related, but the Omi. 
she seemed more like she was old enough to be Tom's grandma and maybe right. uh, Max's great grandma, right? Instead of Tom's mom yeah. and Max's grandma, exactly. She's on up there. I, I mean, the, what do you want from her, Todd? She she seen Krampus in real life. I oh, mean, that could have aged her up. That I didn't probably, think about it's that. It's like being president. If you see Krampus, it ages you up like ten years. It's okay. like, like being president. I apologize, on me. Yeah, one year of living knowing Krampus exists is like ten real world. Wow, years. it takes a toll, brother. Exactly. Um, but basically. They all make for the snowplow, uh, but it doesn't go well for anybody. No. The last time we see Howard in the film, he's dragged off by the elves. Uh, we don't see him anymore. Uh, the rest of the family is kind of picked off by the snow beast. Drug under the snow. Yeah, as they're running. Tom stops to kind of confront and have his showdown with the snow beast. Doesn't go well for him. He gets taken by the snow beast. Tony Collette gets taken. Uh, the other sister gets taken. The sister of uh, Tony Collette, Linda, gets taken until it's just down to, I think it's, was it Stevie and Max? I One think, of them named I Stevie? I think so, yeah. Uh, and they're the only two left. And the elves, I think, was it the elves that drag her out of the uh, the snowplow? I believe it was. They drag her out of the snowplow. Uh, they drag, eventually, they drag Max out of the snowplow, and they kind of bring him face-to-face with Krampus. And you kind of see he he realizes because Krampus hands him the bobble, the ornament wrapped in his discarded letter. And yeah. then you kind of see Max kind of realize that he's responsible for Krampus coming. And uh, Max kind of begs for Stevie to be spared because they're kind of like holding her. Uh, he offers himself up as a uh, sacrifice. And then Krampus refuses the sacrifice and they still toss Stevie in the pit, which I thought was really cool. It's like it's basically a pit to hell is it's what it looked was, like. Portal to hell yeah, like, it's yeah. basically like a pit to hell. And Max, he goes and he sincerely you know, apologizes to Krampus for losing his spirit. And you kind of see Krampus like, <laughs> like, you know, like, right. Uh, maybe I'm accepting your apology, but no, he ends up uh, tossing Max into the pit from hell as well. And uh, I'll let you take it from here. Go through just our last little kind of ending scene here, Todd. So we kind of, as Max is going through the portal, it kind of kind of just fades to white, and we waking up the next morning. Uh, Max is in his bedroom. It's Christmas morning, and I was immediately like, "Oh, is this, are we doing this? Is this, <laughs> this is all, I watched an hour and a half of this, and it's a dream kind of thing." And he gets up and goes downstairs, and there's everybody you know, like, "Hey, buddy, we thought you was gonna sleep all day, you know." And he's sitting there, and everybody just seems to be there normal usual self and they start handing out presents and max gets a present and he opens it up and it's that little that little bobble from krampus Mm -hmm. and everybody starts getting this look on their face like maybe it's coming back to them Mm -hmm. they realize what happened to them and then we're done exactly (laughs) exactly you you kind of pull out and you see that the house is shown through like it's kind of like a, it's in a snow globe. It's in a snow globe, yeah, and it's you just kind of pulled out from that, and it's it's set along with uh, hundreds of other kind of snow globes that are in Krampus's, I guess, collection right. in his little underworld lair in the in the mountains, and I guess for him to like monitor and like spy on them, I guess. Um, but how did how did you interpret the ending? Because I I had one thought, and then I kind of. You know, I looked and kind of looked at the plot summary for, you know, how it's it's kind of written on the Internet, basically. But how did you interpret that? To me, I mean, I, th- I thought, you know, well, we're having you know, the whole thing was a dream thing, like you thought. Right. And then he opens the present and there's the bauble and they all start getting that realization look on their face like, you know, oh, shit, we went through this. And you get that scene of them pulling out in the snow globe. Are they trapped in there forever? See, that's are my, they there? See, that's my thing. Is it? Are they? My my first interpretation was that they are like just trapped in that snow globe, and it's like life doesn't function as it normally does. It's just it's Christmas Day forever, forever, and okay. they're kind of trapped in there. When I was looking at the plot synopsis, the way it's written uh, on on uh, on the internet, basically. It's that Krampus has, you know, them in his collection, and he has that snow globe for him to kind of monitor and spy on them for having spared them. Um, so it's like, is it they're trapped there forever, or is it just a way of him seeing the families that he has spared? To me, I don't know. To me, that seems like, 
I don't know, almost a cop out in a way. Right. Like, so I just wondered how you kind of interpret it because I thought it was just them trapped and it's like a living hell. I'm living in a snow globe for the rest of my life and I have to remember, like, you know, what happened to us. us. But I guess since they're not technically, I guess, in hell, I guess they are spared. So I guess it would make more sense that he monitored them. Grandpa's pussed out. I know, right? (laughs) He monitors them and spies on them from from his snow globes, I guess. Uh, I guess is, is what we're saying here i guess that does make more sense because i guess if we really saw them they would be in hell but true isn't living in a snow globe unable to do anything else isn't that, it's isn't that hell? pretty much hell exactly um one big question i have for you todd so this is a pg-13 film do you think this film would have benefited from an r rating i think so i think if you could have went a hard r here mm. it could have been a lot better yeah, that's my thing with when I look at it, the film uh, in its totality is I think it needed a little bit more of an edge to it. I think it needed to be a little bit more gory, a little bit more adult. Like I get it's hard to make a, you know, a, a, a rated R film in general these days, but then it's like you're making a, a R rated holiday film. Like I get that it's it's got it, it would have you know definitely probably scaled back the budget and things like that, but I think it really needed it. So this was directed by Michael Doherty, who made uh, he did uh, uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters. He also did Trick or Treat, right? And Trick or Treat, I think, is that balance. It has that that edge to it, that like that violence to it, you know, that that kind of little bit of mean spirit in some places that this needed a little bit more of. I think if this was an had an R rating and was a little bit more violent and a little bit more adult and kind of leaned into that creepiness and and kind of scare factor a little bit, I think it would have kind of elevated it past where it ultimately kind of ends up. Yeah, this movie to me kind of almost wants to walk that line kind of like the original Gremlins did, but yeah. it's just it doesn't quite get there. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It kind of it does kind of walk that line a little bit. I just think it needed a little bit more. I needed. I think it needed to push past that. You know, being like a family right, right. kind of Christmas adventure kind of thing. Like yeah. it needed to go a little bit more past that for me to get maximum enjoyment out of it. I think. Gotcha. I, I think as it is, it, it's still pretty solid. But I think I just I wanted more edge to it, Todd. I think it could have been. I think it was a little bit of a wasted opportunity not to push past that PG-13. Go for the R. Yep. Uh, I got some Krampus bits for you here, Todd. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the film was originally set to release on November 25th, was pushed back to December 4th to coincide with the, I'm going to butcher this, Krampusnacht, a traditional Austrian festival held on December 5th that celebrates the Krampus coming to punish naughty children. Michael Doherty describes the Krampus in this film as Santa Claus's shadow. He's not the unstoppable monster that kicks down your door and rampages and grabs you. There's something darkly playful about him. He's having a good time doing what he does, and he enjoys the cat and mouse aspect of it. I can see that. Yeah. I mean, he has plenty of opportunity to just kind of bust in, but he does a lot of, like, cat and mouse kind of stuff, especially the the scenes with Beth and things like that. The Krampus' final design was distilled from various postcards and illustrations of the creature over the years. The visible breath and the cold exteriors was done digitally, but a major component of it involved filming real people in freezers, reading dialogue for the scenes. Their breath was then isolated and added optically into the shots. That's also, in uh, in addition to Snow Watch, I also look for Breath Watch, too. Ah. That's something I always look for as well in these kind of movies. I don't know. It's just weird things about me. The opening sequence was shot on location in a single day at a department store in New Zealand. Your, oh. your your Black Friday trample scene. Ah. <laughs> Max's mom alludes to the noodle incident that estranged the family from a neighboring one. The noodle incident was often referred to but never explained in the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon strip, and Krampus also leaves it unexplained. Ah. Composer Douglas Pipes described his... That's a good name for a composer. That's Pipes. <laughs> yeah, that's Pipes, Doug. Described his music as a collection of twisted Christmas carols with pagan thrown in. He incorporated the sounds of chains, bells, bones, and animal skin drums into the score and had choirs chant and whisper in different tongues. I did think the music was pretty good. It was. Overall, pretty pretty another solid element of the film. One of the few notes they received more than once from the studio was to cut back on the baby crying. 
<laughs> Too much baby crying? Yeah. Okay. Thank God for that. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I can't stand that. Uh, the snow on the ground was made from a material that's usually used for diapers we talked about before. And finally here in the movie, Max shares some candy from his Halloween stash to comfort his cousins. Inside, you can see a lollipop identical to the one used as a weapon by the demonic child Sam from Michael Doherty's movie Trick or Treat. I didn't catch that. So, Todd, you ready to move on to our review? I'm ready. All right, Todd, so give us your final thoughts and review score for Krampus. Uh, For me, for the most part, I prefer my holiday horror to be more centered towards Halloween than Christmas. I kind of prefer my Christmas to be more joyful and triumphant, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Right, right. Uh, With that being said, you know, I kind of enjoyed this film on my initial watch. Uh, Is it going to replace Home Alone or Christmas Vacation in my holiday rotation? You know, probably not. Uh, But I thought the design and look of Krampus was great. I thought the acting in this movie was good for the material. Uh, Me, I give Krampus six little demented gingerbread men, which on our scale is decent. (laughs) Good good deal. Fair enough. Uh, I can't can't disagree. I think we're pretty much in seat. Um, Good looking film. Great sound design. Good music. Um, needed a little bit more edge to it, like we talked about. Needed to go for that hard R rating, I think, to get a stronger score for me. It's a film that I, I I didn't see originally when it came out. The first time I've ever seen it is for for, is for this. Um, I, I actually enjoyed it. I'm glad I kind of crossed it off the list to something I would see. Like you said, is it a is it a holiday classic? I'll go back to over and over again and rewatch around the holidays. No, but as far as as a good one time view, I think it's worth your time. Uh, for me, I also give Krampus a six out of ten, which ranks it as decent. Uh, so, Todd, can you tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media? We're at Tal Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tal Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at talcapespod at gmail.com. Also, if you're so obliged, leaving us a five-star review and your podcast app of choice really helps the show. Popcorn Mumbles will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. See you, guys.